good afternoon to all we'll start the proceedings in 3 minutes from now Hi, engineer Achana. I think uh, we are good to go. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a great pleasure and an opportunity for all of us to meet on this platform for the webinar on emerging trends in computer science and information technology, organized by the Department of Computer Science and Information Technology of Sam Higginbotham University of Agric. I am Archana Singh. And I welcome all the academicians who have joined in from India and abroad. Well, as it is a saying, "Kam karan se pehle le sumiran prabhu kornam." So, before starting, let us join our hands and bow our heads before our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I'll request our university chaplain, Reverend Dr. Samuel Richmond, to lead us in prayer. Okay, before we pray, I like to read from the Bible. Psalm 111, praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the council of the upright and the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds and his righteousness endures forever. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Let us look our Lord in prayer. Father Lord, we are thankful and grateful to you for this wonderful time and opportunity you have given to our Shuat's family that we are able to organize an international webinar under the leadership of Department of Computer Science and Information Technology, Wog Institute of Agriculture, Engineering and Technology. We are thankful, Lord, for this uh, uh, international webinar emerging emerging trends in computer science and information technology as we know that uh, technology is growing and we know that uh, many people are being benefited by that and in the midst of that uh, we are here to help uh, our people we are here to help uh, those who are interested in this area who are working hard scientists and others who are working hard in this area, we may able to, to help them, to give them uh, different views about this. We are thankful, Lord, for the organizing committee. We are thankful, Lord, that you have really equipped them so that uh, they are able to organize such a program uh, during the coronavirus. 
we are thankful for the experts who have joined us, speakers, eminent speakers who have joined us, Lord, and they will be speaking for uh, uh, these two days. Whatever they share, Master, we pray that our participants and our staff members and students be blessed. We are thankful, Lord, that, that through this international webinar, we are able to connect a lot of people from India and outside India also. And that's, that shows, Lord, that how much people are concerned about certain issues that are prevailing in our education system. We, we pray for uh, the dean, the associate, associate dean, the head of the department, as well as the organizing uh, secretaries and others, especially Dr. Klinsinger Jeberson, who has uh, worked hard in uh, coordinating this whole program and her team. We ask your blessing. We are thankful for Sam Higginbottom, University of Agriculture, Technology and Sciences. Lord, uh, you have really blessed our university. We pray for our Honorable Vice Chancellor that you continue to bless him. We pray for our uh, pro-vice chancellors. We pray for uh, uh, others also like our uh, respected registrar. And we also pray for our joint registrar, Engineer CJ Wesley, who always there to help us in connecting with the systems as well as uh, connecting with all of us. We pray for our all our staff members and students that your choicest blessing be upon each one of us. Once again, we commit the entire proceedings of this two-day seminar, and we pray that uh, you will continue to bless all of us. We give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now it's now is the time for the convener. Now is the time for the convener. Dr. Klinziger Jeberson to give a brief introduction about this webinar and deliver the welcome address. Good afternoon all. The outbreak of COVID-19 has led to the rise of webinars that enable experts to share their expertise, benefiting a large number of students and professionals all over the world. This two-day international webinar themed Emerging Trends in Computer Science and IT organized by the Department of Computer Science and IT stewards will expose the participants to some of the state-of-the-art technologies prevailing in IT industry in the areas such as artificial intelligence, digital transformation, application programming interface, and algorithms. Exposing the students and professionals to latest trends is one of the key steps taken to prepare them to face the changing needs of the IT world. The resource persons of this webinar include experts from USA, UK, Canada, and India holding prestigious positions in IT giants like HCL America, Infosys, government organizations, and also academic institutions. Now, I take this opportunity to welcome our esteemed dignitaries and guests on behalf of the Department of Computer Science and IT. First of all, I welcome our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Right Reverend Professor Dr. Rajendra Bilal, who is a visionary. He envisioned Allahabad Agriculture Institute to become a degree awarding in university and made his dream come true. He shows a special interest in academic development and researches. He also extends great support in organizing co-curricular activities. I welcome you, sir. It's my pleasure to welcome our Pro Vice Chancellor AAQA, Professor Dr. A.K. Lawrence, who is also the chief guest of this international webinar. He works tirelessly to maintain the academic standards of our university. I sincerely acknowledge his encouragement in our academic activities 
as well as in organizing events. I welcome our Pro Vice Chancellor Admin, Professor Dr. S. B. Lal, Pro Vice Chancellor Planning, Monitoring and Development, Professor Dr. Sajid Herbert, our Registrar, Professor Dr. Robin L. Prasad, Joint Registrar, Engineer C. John Wesley, Dean VIAET, Professor Dr. Ashok Tripathi, and Associate Dean, Professor Dr. Deepak Lal, to this webinar. I welcome respected directors, deans, head of various departments, and professors. Now, I cordially welcome distinguished speaker, Engineer A. Victor Sundararaj, who is working as head, engineering, and emerging technologies, academy, education, training, and assessment, Infosys Limited, Bangalore, India. I extend my warm welcome to engineer Saktiendran Arunachalam, who is working as Associate General Manager, HCL America, Bellevue, Washington, USA. Hearty welcome to Dr. Pooja Vashist, who is an Assistant Professor in SPM College, University of Delhi, and who is also a visiting faculty, Wilfrid Laurel University, Department of Physics and Computing, Ontario, Canada. I welcome one of our alumnus and speaker, engineer Shobit Pant, who is serving as Information Systems Officer in Indian Oil Corporation Limited, Gugan, India. I'm pleased to welcome engineer Manuel Jabakumar, who is the founder and director of Paul and Sons Technologies, Gloucester, United Kingdom. I'm glad to welcome engineer Venkatesh Prabhu Parthasarathy, who is the senior principal solution architect, supply plan solutions in Orange County, Irvine, USA. Last but not the least, I welcome my dear colleagues and all the participants of this webinar from India and abroad. Welcome one and all. Thank you, ma'am. We have with us Professor Dr. Wilson Jibberson, head, Department of Computer Science and Information Technology, to tell about the department and its achievements. Dr. Jefferson, can you unmute? Thank you. Good afternoon, all. It's my pleasure to introduce about the Department of Computer Science and IT Schwartz. The Department of Computer Science and Information Technology was established in the year 1999. The department is dedicated towards creation of an innovative academic environment, which focuses on the overall development of students. The department is committed to academic excellence in undergraduate and postgraduate education education and research programs across a broad spectrum of disciplines in computer science and engineering. The department aspires to reassert the significance of high quality education by producing competent professionals who can contribute to the growing IT power of our nation. The academic environment consistently broadens the technological base by way of upgrading the infrastructure in emerging areas like data analytics, networking, computer architecture, etc. Eventually, the department aims to emerge as an important source of technological manpower in the country. Now about the faculty members. We have a total of 27 teaching faculty, out of which eight are doctorates, and 22 of them have MTech degree from NITs, and other reputed institutions. We have two faculty members who have qualified UGC net, which is very rare in the field of computer science. The faculty members 
have published research articles in various reputed journals like notable impact with notable impact factors some of the faculty members have authored books which are published with indian and foreign publishers now coming to the programs offered the undergraduate programs which the department is offering are beta computer science and engineering eligibility plus 2 with pcm bachelor of computer applications bca eligibility plus 2 with mathematics as one of the subjects b then bsc computer science eligibility plus 2 with pcm we offer four post graduate programs they are mtech computer science and engineering mtech software engineering master of computer applications mca regular and two years late entry program and also msc computer science we offer four phd in three streams phd in computer science phd in computer engineering and phd in computer applications the faculty and students of the department are involved in various activities we have got an experiential learning unit in the department to train the students in hardware and networking and software development and maintenance events such as conferences seminars webinars workshops summer and winter training guest lectures etc in collaboration with ieee computer society of india microsoft red hat and other technological societies to expose the students to emerging trends in computer science and it the department gradually conducts cultural activities to provide a platform for the students to exhibit their talents also the department conducts basic computer lit literacy program to empower the supporting staffs of the university with basic computer knowledge now coming to the laboratory facilities computer science and it department is equipped with the six state of the art laboratories provided with wifi facility and networking with uninterrupted power supply we have more than 250 computer systems with the latest configuration with intel core i7 processors now about our alumni <clears throat> the alumni of our department are placed in reputed companies and organizations of private and government sectors in india and abroad some of the prominent alumni who have completed bca btech mca and mtech have been placed in prestigious organizations such as dell sap tcs indian oil corporation and so on our alumni are holding higher administrative positions in government one of our alumni of mtech computer science 2013 batch engineer pangaj topped in up public service commission in the year 2013 and currently he is posted as sdm in barabanki uttar pradesh once again i wish you all a great learning experience thank you one and all thank you thank you sir i would request now engineer c john wesley joint registrar administration to give a brief history of our university which is more than 100 years old and to tell about its journey and achievements on the pathway a uh, respected chief guest uh, our mentor professor dr ak lawrence pro chancellor academics dean wow institute of agriculture and technology and associate dean head department of computer science and information technology uh, distinguished speakers of this international webinar and my dear participants sam again bottom university of agriculture technology sciences shewards earlier known as alabad agriculture institute was established in the year 1910 under the able leadership of an american scientist dr sam higginbottom pioneered in agriculture the institute was the first to offer an agriculture engineering program in southeast asia and fourth in the world the institution has completed now more than 110 years of dedicated and relentless service to the nation with its clear vision and mission gospel and plow and motto feed the hungry and serve the land under the able leadership of a honorable vice chancellor most of run professor rajendra bilal alabad agriculture institute was conferred the deemed to be university status by the ministry of human resource development 
government of india new delhi in the year 2000 it was later renamed during our centenary year by the ministry of human resource development government of india in 2010 to honor our founder the institution was renamed as sam higginbottom institute of agriculture technology sciences deemed to be university in the year 2016 after considering the adequate facilities of teaching and non teaching staff and other essential infrastructure facilities the uttar pradesh legislature decided to upgrade and reconstitute and establish shiarts deemed university as a full fledged university under state act hence now we are sam higginbottom university of agriculture technology sciences established under state act shuarts is a united endeavor of the christian community in india for promoting rural life and development in conformity with the christian vision of human kind and the creation university is held in trust as a common ecumenical heritage by the christian churches and christian organizations of our country it seeks to be a national center of professional excellence in education and service to the people with participation of students and faculty members all over india and abroad we operate with faculty of agriculture faculty of engineering and technology faculty of science business studies theology animal husbandry humanities education film and mass communication and health sciences Schwartz is an ISO 9001 2015 certified institution and a recognized member of Association of Indian Universities Indian Agriculture Universities Association International Association of Universities and many other associations uh university has signed many national and international MOUs with institutions of repute in national and international arena university grants commission placed our institution under a grade deemed universities in the year 2013 when we were a deemed university in the year 2014 nac accredited us with a grade and uh, many of our institutes are accredited or by various accrediting agencies across the country currently we have more than 13000 students pursuing their higher studies on campus uh, we have more than 1600 teaching non teaching faculty members across the country on campus teaching and non teaching with these words i would like to welcome you all on behalf of the university and wish you all wonderful experience through this two day international webinar today and tomorrow thank you thank you sir we have with us our chief guest professor dr a k lawrence sir pro vice chancellor academic affair and quality assurance and i will request him to give the inaugural address and encourage us all sir can you unmute thank you am i audible now am i audible yes yes sir please go ahead all right uh, good afternoon dr victor uh, sundaraj uh, dr arachalam dr pooja vishesht uh, engineer shobhit uh, pant engineer Manuel Jeva Kumar, uh, Engineer Part Sarthi, the Dean and Associate Dean of uh, Vaughan Institute of uh, Agriculture, Engineering and Technology, the Head Department of Computer Science and Information Technology, and uh, Dr. Glensiga Jabberson, Convener, and uh, Organizing Committee members of the Department, and uh, Engineer John C. Wesley, our Joint Registrar Administration. uh i am pleased uh, to uh, be a part of this uh, international uh, webinar on emerging trends in computer science and information technology uh, and i'm pretty sure this is very much uh, attached to the perspective of covid 
uh, with all kind of privileges uh, and uh, rights and freedom we are also managing covid-19 pandemic uh, which is uh, uh, spreading quickly uh, causing uh, a great deal of fear and unrest not only in india but uh, across uh, the globe and uh, in spite of uh, this unprecedented crisis we are utilizing this time by connecting scientists engineers experts doctors uh, academicians uh, uh, to specifically share their wisdom understanding and knowledge on emerging trends in computer science and information technology another question uh, uh, nowadays is uh, very prominent that how computers can contribute in controlling covid-19 pandemic and the same is being posted to export in ad- artificial uh, intelligence all over the world uh, the artificial intelligence tool can uh, help in many different ways uh, like predict the spread of coronavirus map its genetic evolution as it is trans- uh, it transmits uh, from human to human speed up uh, diagnosis and uh, in development of potential uh, treatments and also helping policy makers to cope with related issues uh, such as impact on transport food supplies and uh, travel as covid-19 has taken up the world into uh, uncharted uh, territory the deep learning systems which computers use to acquire new capabilities don't necessarily have the data that they need to produce useful outputs many tech giants are contributing their computing power to help hospitals perform diagnosis and possible find possibly find a cure the us government and public health experts are considering taking up the help of uh, private companies to aggregate anonymous smartphone location data which is a powerful tool to pinpoint the next uh, hotspot or uh, allocate health uh, resources uh, which uh, with the help of the google and facebook in south korea multiple apps uh, were built to help track the virus spread by sourcing data from public available government information people in singapore have imposed self quarantine since uh, initial days of uh, outbreak and are contacted multiple times in a day to click uh, an online link to share their phone's uh, location now israel is using an anti terror technology to counter the virus cyber monitoring has been deployed on track individuals uh, who tested positive in real time uh, through their mobile phones to catch breach breaches in uh, quarantine social media is also part of it and very important part of it uh, with an appropriate technologies may also play an important role during pandemic however there are two things we have to be very careful of number 1 the disease itself and misinformation spread through the social media now every notification is an update or a speculation about the virus but it is uh, very difficult and it has become very difficult to filter out the facts they have the propensity of fear but also gives hope the effort of department of computer science and uh, information technology of our university will certainly enlighten the path to overcome the challenge with more opportunities and uh, with uh, a positive outcome as regard to role of computer science and information technology is concerned uh, i would like to thank the keynote spoke speakers for uh, their valuable time also express my gratitude to chairperson conveners organizing secretaries for organizing this uh, meaningful event okay the uh, hoping uh, dystopia remains just a popular netflix type and we emerge from this crisis with a lifetime of lessons don't forget to keep a distance wear mask when you are out and wash your hands regularly
Thank you so much and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I invite our first speaker, Engineer A. Victor Sundaraj. He is working as the head of Engineering and Emerging Technologies Academy at Infosys ETA, a strategic business partner team working collaboratively with the clients and business units to design reskilling programs and project specific trainings on business domains and technologies of aerospace, automotive, discrete high tech networking communication, embedded VLSI, industrial automation. He was a program manager and faculty at Infosys for a collaborative master's degree program with Coventry University UK and has also led collaborative program university and IITs for organizational level competency initiatives. He has more than two decades of experience in engineering education and competency development at corporate and academics. He's also a faculty and mentor for Infosys Campus Connect and internship programs. He also has been actively part of forums such as IUCEE, NAFEMS, ASME, SAE, and NASCOM for engineering education enhancement. He has been a part of research advisory board and board of studies in various engineering institutions. I welcome you, sir. And now over to engineer Victor Sundaraj. Thank you um, for the crisp introduction. I hope I am audible. Sir, can somebody please confirm if I am audible? <clears throat> yes, sir, please go ahead. Uh, kindly take it in a presentation mode, please. All right, okay. Yeah. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, can somebody please Acknowledge either in the chat window if I'm audible. Yes, yes, please go ahead. With an assumption that I'm audible, I will continue. Um, so thank you for this wonderful opportunity and thank you for the crisp introduction. Um, I'm sure um, um, uh, I, I mean, uh, I, I really want to acknowledge and appreciate the efforts from the university uh, to uh, you know, to make this webinar. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure we have a lot of constraints at hand, but we are able to come out of all of this and successfully plan this and and run this webinar with all the constraints at hand. Um, I wish a grand success uh, to the team, to the university, to the management, to the professors who are coordinating this. And my session will be. Um, a kind of a preamble to the other uh, deeper topics uh, that are going to follow today and tomorrow. And um, um, and I'm sure I think uh, uh, the faculty members uh, who have found time to be part of the session uh, really um, find it valuable uh, and, um, and informative uh, in the areas of digital transformation, as well as the live enterprises, which is a new concept which is uh, which Infosys is 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 pioneering in this field um <clears throat> so as i get into this topic of digital transformation i'm sure i think around march um, all of us have gone through this uh, pandemic and uh, this unprecedented situation where we need to close down our uh, institutions we need to close down our offices uh, but if you look at it um, uh, the organizations the enterprises who had who had planned ahead this particular digital infrastructures were able to successfully and seamlessly move 
from their uh, infrastructure to digital infrastructures and are able to, within a few weeks, they're able to continue their normal uh, working schedules, right? So back, um, these are the challenges which every enterprise is going through uh, in the current days. Um, be it the emerging technologies and expansion of digital technologies or digital native customers and their continuously growing expectations, new age competitors and cost imperatives, new delivery models and new ways of working and geopolitical challenges and diversity. These are every organization, every enterprise is going through uh, in the current days and much more uh, post uh, COVID-19 pandemic situations. So if we have to go into each one of them, if I take the technology in itself, it's evolving uh, faster than ever and enterprises are adopting these technologies than never before. And uh, this has become a kind of a mandate and a foundation for any enterprises. At the same time, the scarcity of talent, the scarcity of trained talent is also becoming a challenge across uh, enterprises. At the same time, um, MNCs and global organizations are also uh, continuing to face the geopolitical and, um, um, and other political challenges across uh, countries. The visas or be trained workforce, employment challenges within the countries are disrupting the way the organization work in the current days. And if you look at it, um, well, as we talk about all of these challenges, on the other hand, we have also witnessed many of these digital transformations happen right before our eyes. Um, I want to you know, highlight the other. Right? So many times uh, we take other um, uh, becomes a laughing stock when we look at the uh, other card, right? And uh, we are not able to identify ourselves in the photos. But if you look at it, that is something which is significant that has happened in the country the last few years. And that is one of the um, uh, entity or a platform um, which is owned by uh, a country, not by any private players, right? So if you look at Facebooks or Googles, they are the ones who have billions of users, 5 billion or 6 billion, 7 billion users. But if you look at Aadhaar, so that is also incomparable in billions of users who are part of the platform. And if you look at it now, without Aadhaar, you'll not be able to open a bank account. You'll not be able to open a, you know, get a mobile connection in the, in the current situations. So that is something you know, which we are, we are seeing right in front of our own eyes. And um, you know, we are using it effectively. That is a, one of the digital transformation, digital um, at the transaction that is happening right before our eyes. That's number one. So number two, even look at the way uh, we are now using the fast tags. Obviously, the travels have come down, but a few months ago, uh, when the fast tag has become popular, we just with a with a sticker just go through the uh, sensing device, and your vehicle is identified. It's connected to your account, Paytm or other accounts. Automatically, I mean, the uh, the cost used to be deducted. Right. That's another transformation that we have seen in our own eyes. And if you look at the other one, um, you know, all the digital currencies and uh, the transaction that is happening, right? So we used to, um, uh, I used to say in a funny way, uh, when we were kids um, uh, 25, 30 years ago, we used to stand in long queues to pay the electricity bill and uh, the mobile bill, I mean, the, the telephone bills um, you know, at the counters. But with a click of a button through a mobile app, we are able to comfortably you know, pay all of those things. And the current time, we don't have to carry any cash, right? We just use Paytms or Google Pays or um, you know all of these apps, and you know are able to very very easily seamlessly do the transactions at hand. So these are some of the transformations that we have seen happening right in front of our eyes itself. So this digital economy is rapidly evolving, and new intangible skills with technical skills are valued highly by enterprises. So it is the responsibility of the universities, institutions uh, to equip, to enable uh, the students for this future requirement of skills. Next few slides, I want to share one of the research that was done by the Infos Infosys Knowledge Institute, uh, where they have done uh, a research with about um, 1,000 plus senior executives 
uh, in the organizations that are 1 billion plus um, uh, revenue and the senior management team, they're trying to see what are their different uh, digital uh, initiatives that they have taken uh, internally within their companies and how they are progressing. So this is how um, you know the results look like. So if you look at it, uh, the thousand different organizations and the senior executives that we have, um, you know, uh, I mean, that we have interacted with, we could able to put these organizations or enterprises into three different categories. Some of them are watchers, explorers, and visionaries. Obviously, as the name indicates, watchers are some. Uh, you know, they are putting all efforts to explore and mature the digital investment and, and the technologies within the organization. And visionary teams themselves, right? Maybe the, the Amazons or the Facebook, you know, who are, I mean, the startups that are born uh, with a digital platform and the digital mindset in mind. So this is how, you know, we classify, um, you know, these three uh, different digital uh, players in the company in the, in the market <clears throat> and on the other hand if you look at the, the digital initiatives in itself we classify them into again four different um, uh, categories uh, foundations and uh, customer specific initiatives and uh, initiatives that uh, put the enterprises in the forefront so we look at it um, again i can say whether you can call it as an initiative or uh, um, the, the skills or the competencies uh, we can interchange. We need to have the infrastructure. We need to modernize the, uh, the legacy applications that are there, an ability to connect inter applications and automation and improvement in the business process management and and most importantly, uh, the cybersecurity, the security in, in all layers, uh, which some of the uh, some of the organizations and initiatives are the basic things that needs to be done for any enterprises who are getting into this journey of uh, digital transformation. And as they mature, then comes the cluster of mainstay. That's where the aspects of uh, cloud, big data analytics, DevOps and agile, IT automation, enterprise solutions, IoT, um, enterprise learning management platforms, RPAs, and AI are going to play a major role. Right? So each of these technology, if you look at it, play a major role in the enterprises, um, you know, in the automation and in their digital journey. So if you look at IoT, now any systems um, are connected. Uh, I mean, people to people, machine to machines are getting connected. We're able to sense what is happening, and the machines are able to respond to uh, uh, what whatever is happening. And we are able to um, move all of this data to the cloud, analyze it, and then actuate it and, and get the de desired results. Right? So in simple terms, if I have to explain IoT, that's what it's all about. And the same way, if you look at um, the cloud, right? So not only cloud, now it's moving uh, to poly cloud, right? So it's not just one cloud, you have multiple cloud um, and ability to scale up in an, in an exponential way. And other, uh, similarly, um, the robotic process automations, building the, the bot factory, building the, um, you know, automated interactions, the bots to interact both voice assisted or be it, uh, um, you know, uh, text assisted bots are becoming more and more popular. And the center of everything is artificial intelligence and the big data analytics that's playing a vital role. And similarly, um, the players who are moving to the next layer, right, are adopting um, some of the customer specific initiatives. So be it digital marketing or product engineering or omnichannel marketing, the content personalization, 3D printing. So these are things that are uh, taking the enterprises into the next level and to the forefront are those virtual reality building the experiences that are that are absolutely stunning and uh, fulfilling for the customers. I mean, AR, VR, blockchain are leading the uh, other initiatives within the enterprise. So these are the core clusters. Um, if any enterprise, any organization is getting into the digital journey, these are the things that are very much required. And um, you know, the skills are also, the required skills are also 
uh, centered around these clusters and the organizations are also looking for talents in these clusters. And if you look at it, um, we talked about the watchers, explorers, and um, the visionaries. The journey is not simple for every, every anybody. To be uh, coming in the way of enterprises. So these are some of the challenges. I just want inability to experiment quickly, right? And um, legacy systems, they are stuck with the legacy systems, not able to, you know, um, uh, develop them and um, um, uh, or uh, right, inability to work across uh, silos and inadequate uh, collaboration between IT and lines of business, risk covers culture, lack of change management capabilities, lack of corporate vision for digital, lack of skills, insufficient budget, uh, cybersecurity. So these are the challenges which are pulling the um, um, you know, uh, pulling these industries, be it watchers or explorers, down. If you look at it, uh, there are some improvements in terms of the challenges, but there are some challenges which continue to exist. For example, lack of talents, even though it is shrinking, but still continue to be the challenge because um, it is the same organizations vying for the talents across from the same pool, right? So, and uh, the ability of uh, uh, you know, the engineers or the students to pick up these digital technologies quickly, the learnability of the students, right, ability to adapt to these technologies is also a, is also posing a challenge, you know, for the for the enterprises. On the other hand, if you look at it, other major challenges here is um, a risk averse culture and legacy systems which are pulling it down. So when I say risk covers cultures, I mean the ability of the leaders to take um, bold decisions, right? Or be it um, the managerial layer, or be it the um, you know layer down, uh, their ability to be supported by the adequate uh, skills and uh, uh, the support engineers is also pulling them down, right? So one of the major things is um, you know this this particular bold visions and bold. Uh, decision making is also uh, becoming a factor, a soft factor in this transition of uh, a digital journey. While rest of the other things are uh, are being addressed in some way, you know, be it cybersecurity, there are many solutions, many platforms, many layers of are being built to be, um, uh, I mean, to be safe and secure. But at the same time, even the hackers are becoming more and more. Um, you know, finding newer ways to hack and um, and put trouble for the enterprises, and it's an evolving area in itself. So, moving on, if you look at uh, the digital transformation, it's not just for the IT or just not for the enterprises. I mean, high tech industries. Digital transformation journey is uniform across different industries, be it the insurance industry or the utilities industry or the retail industry or even the financial services, automotive industries. Everybody is moving towards uh, their own digital transformation in their own field, automations, or be it uh, you know integration of systems, industrial IOTs or commercial IOTs. This is evolving and finding their own way in the respective organizations. And this becomes a kind of a top uh, initiatives across organizations, right? adoption of agile and DevOps, automations, design, learning and proximity, if you have to dwell a little deeper in each one of them. Agile, if you look at it, gone are those days, right? So where we need to spend months to collect the requirements uh, and then you know uh, put together the requirements document, get a sign up from the client, and then you know, start working on um, uh, you know the project, and by the time it comes out, that is not what the client wanted, right? So inability to adapt to the client change requirements quickly, right? So what happens at the end is the volleyball game. You know, I used to normally quote this. Um, the design department used to say uh, inability of the manufacturing department. The manufacturing department used to say this is the inability of the design department. We do not get the requirements on hand at the right time. So. It goes on and on. So the need at the time is to build organizations, projects, and programs which are nimble, which are able to adapt and work in a, in a micro user story based um, you know, situations and ability to involve customers as a product owners in the process in itself, take their views at every steps 
and sprints and uh, you know daily um, daily meetings and uh, you know ability to change and adopt and reporting is all what is you know needed in the current times at the same time again ai uh, automation becomes a core of any companies and when it comes to the design um, and um, maybe i will extend it a little further to design thinking as engineers or, or as um, you know uh, um, uh, as a technocrat we are equipped to solve the problems actually what is most needed currently is identify the problems and go deeper ask why is in in multiple sense why should i do it why is this needed right and then going to the root of the problem and coming out with uh, the micro problems and then ability to build applications that can solve those problems is again the need of the hour at the same time every every enterprise every organization is is focusing on the learning right so if you look at some of these uh, studies um, you know done by mckinsey which says uh, close to about um, you know 70 to 80 percentage of the workforce within organization needs a reskilling right um, whatever they are doing they are not the masters of it right and 70 percentage of organization they are not prepared for the required skills of the future right so it means there is a requirement of larger reskilling initiatives at the organization if this is the condition at the enterprises and industries i think much more is needed at the institutional level at the education university level to to quickly adapt the content and teach students prepare students towards the digital needs of the industries Right, and and again, so there are other initiatives um, you know, which are which are leading and which are becoming scaled, as you can see from a 3D printing to AI to uh, LMS, business process management, digital marketing. These are other initiatives that are growing at a higher scale. In all of these things, if you look at it, they used to be measured as a digital maturity index, but it's now moving towards live enterprise. So what does it mean is the ability of the organization to sense right and the ability of the organization to uh, respond and the ability of the organization to learn from uh, what what they have gone through and evolve and be a living organization so that's what actually the entire live enterprise is all about so going a little further is it a concept is it a framework is it a service offering is it a platform not exactly right so but it is actually an amalgamation of different platforms different you know services that comes together which makes any organization or an enterprise a live enterprise so some of these examples if you look at it as a um, as a as an individual human being we have adopted to many things we have adopted to mobile banking we have adopted to communications through whatsapp or skype see look at it now so we are uh, we are connected through zoom and we are on entertainment. We are we are we have adopted to new means of entertainment. Um, uh, I mean, again, in the in the transport and shopping, there are new means of digital that we have adopted um, over the last few years. Right, and we have become sentient. And as individuals are sentient, and enterprises are also need to become sentient. So, what it means exactly? You know, being sentient or being a live enterprise. So, if you look at Amazon, right? If you search for something in Google. Right, you automatically get some recommendations in your Facebook, right? And when you log into the um, Amazon app next time, you get the recommendations that uh, you know these are these could be your next purchases. I think these are your interests. You you may want to look at these items, right? So how do they get it? You know, I mean they are becoming more and more intuitive uh, to know and to understand your needs depending on you know what you are searching and what you are doing i mean the application that, that that needs to be built or that ought to be built needs to be built based on this intuitive um, you know sense of uh, the enterprises take the next example of uh, you know your olas and ubers right that is they are responsive so if you look at um, um, you know if you are booking a cab to move from one place to another place Right, different days, different timings within the day. You now you get to travel for a different rates. Right? How is it happening? It's not somebody is dictating, sitting behind the system and dictating. Okay, this should be the charge uh, at this point of time. The app, the application, the platform in itself is so responsive. Right? It takes the, it it processes those things. It has its own digital brain, and based on which it takes the decisions on on this time of the day or depending upon. Um, the amount of ride requests that are coming from this place to another place, 
how can I adjust the um, you know um, uh, the rates, right? And um, I mean, uh, accordingly, I can I can provide different rates and at the same time keep the keep both customer as well as um, you know the taxi owners as well as the company more profitable. So that's the the responsive you know, organization being able to take quick decisions and uh, uh, work based on their own uh, digital. Uh, brains and digital automation AI systems, which is built in between, which learns and responds uh, intuitively. <laughs> and if you look at it, another one, the perceptive, right? So many times, you know, we look at, if we look at um, uh, LinkedIn, um, uh, I mean, you put your profile uh, or you search for some profile, right? You automatically get those recommendations, right? This could be your, um, you know, um, this could match your needs or this particular industry. Now, um, LinkedIn is also used for new exploring, uh, you know, uh, in this virtual mode of operations, exploring new opportunities, new business opportunities through LinkedIn, right? So you put your own solutions, it automatically helps you to the potential customers, you know, who could be in need and thereby exploring the uh, opportunities uh, and and leading you to those giving you leads to those new business opportunities and customers and ability to connect uh, people who are in need and who offer the solution so that's the system you know, which is working in a perceptive way so a live enterprise is nothing but an organization it has become truly digital from inside out uh, functions like a digital native like a living organism which is intuitive responsive and perceptive Right. So that's that's exactly what is a, a live enterprise is all about. Extending a little further, right? If you look at it, uh, live enterprise is nothing but um, an organization which is connected. And when I say connected, here where I think the aspects of IoT comes into picture, ability to put uh, the sensors, monitor, right, and ability to observe, right. When I say observe, um, you know, when you make some changes, or for example, uh, let me take an example of the zoom in itself, right. Uh, how many of you, how many are actually attentive? How many are actually listening? Right. So, can we get those uh, uh, sense of uh, the participants? Uh, how many are actually not not listening, disturbed? So, are we able to observe? Right. So, such systems be able to uh, sentient uh, exactly means ability to sense, respond, evolve, learn, and evolve. Right. As a living organization and being able to adapt. Um, uh, and 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 come out with the innovative solutions. So if you look at on the left side, it also requires uh, a change in mindset, right? So they call it as uh, micro is a new mega, right? Uh, I was saying before, um, you have to ask these questions of why, not just okay, you have a problem, you should not look at um, you know, the solution immediately, and go deeper and try to understand why. Why should I do it? Why is it required, right? And keep asking these whys and whys and whys and go to the micro of the problem, right? So that's how this micro services and other things, you know, comes into picture. And again, extending, becoming a, uh, you know, having a platform mindset, it's not just a monolithic application that you develop, right? So if you look at uh, like your Androids or iOS, your ability to, you know, uh, others to pick up and build on top of it and then coexist and be at peace, right? So that's the, uh, I mean, extensible architecture uh, you have to keep in mind when you build applications and uh, and have a platform mindset. And sentience, uh, ecosystem interactions are the key to the entire live enterprise. So there are many ways um, while we offer this as an offering to many of our customers, um, we eat our own dog food. So we first implement anything that we, Sell uh, internally, so we have. I mean, in one of the uh, one of the aspect of employee experience, and these are different uh, platforms that are used to Infosys internally. Infosys Launchpad is for onboarding employees, new joiners uh, into the company. Right, so obviously you now everybody is joining virtually. There is no uh, no way to meet and greet and you know. Uh, uh, have the fun and do the induction uh, more formally, it has to be done virtually. So there is a, an application, there is a platform through which they get onboarded into the company. And regular um, you know, personal productivity and convenient activities happens through another platform called as InfiMe. Similarly, the work-related things uh, through InfiWork and anything related to learning uh, in the company happens through a platform, what we call as a Lex. Um, learning expounded or learn anything is a platform that we use to 
um, uh, uh, that, that's available for the employees to learn anytime, anywhere, on any device to the employees. So, I mean, these are different platforms that are used primarily to enhance uh, the employee experience in the organization, right? So, when we were hit by uh, COVID uh, and the lockdown in March, uh, one of the thing, again, I'm going deeper into the learning aspects, which will be uh, useful for this community. So we had to close down our Mysore where we used to do the um, uh, in-person residential onboarding program, foundation program, which happens for about four months for, for any new joiners in Infosys. It's actually the world's largest corporate training festival. We had to close down. We have to evacuate um, close to about 10,000 people uh, in, in a week time. And because we had thought about it, we had this learning platform, which is you know which we had implemented successfully for two years. In a couple of weeks, we are able to you know, move to the virtual means of training, and close to about six to six thousand to eight thousand people have started learning um, you know, through the platform. So it helps when you have such a platform, a digital infrastructure in place, where you will be able to seamlessly move across. And this is again something I think as an institution um, uh, and um, uh, in the days to come, definitely this is what uh, we'll have to look at. Any learning ecosystem should have these core, uh, four core tenets. This is what actually the, um, uh, the tenets of the platform that we have built intern I mean, internally, which will be obviously useful for, for anybody or any organization, any institutions. The platform should be convenient, uh, should make learning uh, available in a convenient way. What does it mean here is it should facilitate omnichannel learning. Learn anytime, anywhere, on any device, right? So you learn through mobile you, or you learn through your iPad or tabs or you use your desktops or um, you know, laptop. You should be able to move across. What you have learned should be, you know, you should be able to see the progress in any device anytime that you log in. And should be able to learn both when you're offline and online, even when you're traveling, even when you're not connected to the internet, are you able to download and learn and when you're connected, are you able to sync up? I think that's something which is, uh, you know, which is again, a need of the hour. So the first one is making learning convenient. The second aspect is making it relevant, right? As a platform, it has to make, uh, you know, uh, the content, relevant content made for relevant people. There are aspects of personalization, the aspects of recommendation that comes into picture, right? So it's not that the whole world is made available for them. They should have the recommendation. This is what is meant and available for you, which you can con consume. And uh, again, when it comes to the content, it has to be, um, uh, it has to have a micro learning to macro learning or what we call it as a full stack programs, right? So, uh, I mean, we all understand being in this field of education, uh, a learner, uh, typically, if their attention is only about you know seven to eight minutes or so, right? So um, you, we need to have such micro learnings to quickly get their attention and then have some interaction and then introduce the next topic and move on, right? So from micro learning to full stack program, we should have infrastructure. I mean, we should it should be a one stop solution for the learners. And third aspect is again very important: uh, the generation which is used to the gamification and aspects of you know, the games, et cetera, they need to be engaged continuously, right? So that's where aspects of social collaboration, the cohorts, ability to interact, ability to have a discussion forum and keep it live is all important uh, in the current day scenario where they're able to learn from each other, exchange their views, exchange their learnings. I think that's very important. At the same time, uh, the platforms and the ability of uh, the platforms to provide a hands-on environment, the sandbox environment right there. They don't have to run around for installations and then you know, um, you know, go through all those hassles of uh, installations and setting it up. Just a click of a button, it should open a sandbox environment for them to practice whatever they are learning, right? And fourth aspect is making it matter. It's not a standalone system through APIs being built on open source. It should be able to connect to you know, each other to their performance systems or you know, uh, to their evaluation systems whereby uh, the full benefits are realized, right? So this is a holistic uh, learning system, right? Which, is, which has been built, I'm sure. I think this is the way uh, any organization is looking at learning internally. <clears throat> So as I, I mean, uh, move towards um, closing my talk. So this is something which um, you know we are doing internally. 
as I said, be it a digital transformation or a live enterprise. So what is important is what are those underlying foundation technologies which everyone should be aware of, right? So we call it as the ABCDs of uh, uh, new foundations of IT, right? Um, uh, uh, we just put it in an easy way so that people can remember. A indicates uh, artificial intelligence, you know, automation, agile, um, or autonomous vehicles or AR, VR, it keeps expanding and B indicates big data, blockchain, and C for cloud and cybersecurity, D for digital and um, you know, DevOps or uh, design thinking, and E for edge computing, IoT, enterprise architecture. So these are different um, you know, digital technologies one needs to be aware of. We always um, go by what we call it as a a T model of learning. Uh, we have different models, T model or a COM model or a Z model, right? So when I say T model, what it means is you should have a, um, a width of, uh, a breadth of uh, awareness of different technologies and you should have your own specialization in one of the area, right? So that's what a T model is. So uh, every engineer, I mean, be it in the computer science or IT field, you should be aware of at least the 101s of all of these technologies that are that are laying the foundation for the digital now. And you should pick up your own specialization and uh, and go deeper and get certified or you know, uh, be ready to build applications on those areas. Right? So that's the, um, um, you know, the T model of learning, what we call it as. And as you go along, we also recommend what we call as a, a Z model of learning, right? So you learn something, you unlearn and then relearn, right? So that's again becoming a need of the hour, right? As these technologies evolve in a, in a much, much uh, in a faster way, it's it's very important, you know, one needs to uh, sometimes unlearn or uh, realize the potential of other behavioral skills and then quickly adapt the other adjacent technologies which are evolving and be ready for the market. So the essence is, I think the culture of learning should be uh, you know, imbibed and uh, you know, should be the, uh, is, a, is the need of the hour for, for anybody uh, you know, who is in this field. Um, lastly, um, uh, Infosys has made an effort, the platform that I have mentioned, uh, Lex or Wingspan, uh, we have made available um, uh, a toned on version of the platform to the institute, to the to the faculty and students uh, in India. So there are close to about uh, eight eight lakh fifty thousand students who are using this platform currently, which is called as a infitq.infosys.com. So anybody will be able to you know uh, log in, create your own account, and start learning. So there are foundation of IT courses that are available in the platform. Uh, from Python programming to object-oriented programming, data structures, and DBMS SQL. So there are you know, close to about um, uh, you know, 200 uh, to 250 hours of learning on these foundational technologies. And we have also introduced um, some of the technology 101s, like AI 101, blockchain 101, big data 101 kind of, uh, IoT 101 kind of uh, 101 topics, digital basic topics are also part of the platform. Uh, uh, both uh, faculty and students can benefit from it. And at the same time, this platform is also used for, uh, uh, as an engine for Infosys recruitment. So while uh, you know, some people get the opportunity of campus recruitment, this is one of the means of our company to reach to the best of the talents available across the country, right? So uh, time to time, there are uh, certification tests which are rolled out on the platform uh, where you know uh, this intimation will be uh, going to all those people who are registered in the platform, and they can take up the certification test, and if they clear it, they get an opportunity to be part of uh, further selection process uh, you know, for the company. So this is something which is useful. I'm sure I think it will be useful for the faculty or students um, you know, who join the. Uh, uh, so <clears throat> this is what I want to briefly convey to you. The organizations are. Now moving towards uh, a live enterprise uh, concept or a platform or um, or a behavior, uh, and every organization is, I mean, aiming to becoming resilient um, and not be disrupted by these challenges and being able to adapt and gain from new opportunities that are opening up. A key to all of this is um, uh, keeping one self-relevant um, on all of these uh, latest technologies, be it through the certification, be it through formal trainings, and how universities, institutions are going to facilitate this, how the individuals are going to keep themselves relevant by learning and continuously learning, 
is what is what is going to uh, be the destiny of uh, you know this digital transformation or um, or the mission of live enterprise so i stop here um, again once again thank you for the opportunity maybe now i look at if there are any questions in the chat window All right, I think um, uh, over to you, uh, convener. Okay, thank you, sir, for an insight into digital transformation in live enterprises. Our next speaker for today is engineer Saktiendran Arunachalam. He is Associate General Manager, HCL America, Bellevue, Washington, USA. He's having 20 years of IT experience and has worked with various technologies, domains, and customers across the globe. He's a specialist in the areas of enterprise application integration, service-oriented architecture, application programming interface, digital process automation. Currently, he's working for Microsoft Worldwide Operations for the digital transformation. So I welcome you, sir. Over to you. Kindly unmute. Okay. Able to hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, perfect. Let me. Okay. Uh... Hello, everyone. Um, I would like to thank uh, Schwartz Management and uh, Department of Computer Science for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity. Uh, let me take a couple of minutes to introduce myself. Uh, I'm uh, Shakti Indra Narnachalam, uh, working for uh, Hatsil America as an Associate General Manager. Uh, and I am from digital and analytics practice. So I do have like 20 years of experience and uh, uh, worked in various uh, uh, domains like banking, high tech, airlines, and manufacturing. And uh, currently engaged with uh, Microsoft uh, and in Seattle, Washington State, United States. So uh, with, with this, uh, let's get into today's topic. So uh, for today's presentation, uh, I, I just wanted to make it at a very high level. Uh, what what is an API and uh, uh, provide some couple of examples of like what API is all about and where it's being used and what is the need for the uh, API now and uh, and coming to the technical details I don't want to get into uh, uh, low level details I just wanted to keep it at a very high level and then uh, we'll uh, talk about like how API has evolved over the period of time. Right. So, and, and what is going to be the uh, future for uh, API and how API is going to uh, grow in future and, and all the areas. So that's 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 what uh, uh, we'll be going through. So uh, API stands for Application Programming Interface. So. We've, on, on our day-to-day -day, uh, activities, like on day-to-day -day basis, like we, uh, whatever uh, we, we are using, or we are very much dependent on the API in almost all activities. 
the moment we start uh, take take our mobile phone and start using any app we are in turn using uh, api whether it's a weather app or it's a facebook uber ola uh, twitter or any 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 other app the way the mode of communication for those applications are via uh, api so so uh, bef before we uh, further go down like let's understand the meaning of the word interface in uh, application programming interface right so interface is nothing but a, a touch point if i want to uh, unlock my uh, mobile phone i need to press a specific button in my phone to do uh, so right so apple has given me the specification apple has given the specification for the device that like if you press this particular button this is what the action it will write. so so the specification was given by apple likewise we have many interfaces to interact in our uh, daily uh, routine like while we drive our car or while operating an atm machine or operating a coffee vending machine we have interfaces but all those interfaces are like the interfaces which are in device same way if i want to buy something in amazon website right so what 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 i what i'm doing like i get into the website i provide my user credentials search for products then i want to uh, 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 whatever products that i want to buy like i will add it to a cart and then like make payment and then uh, I'll, i'll check out right so for doing all these activities amazon website or the mobile app is providing me with a lot of interfaces like buttons or text boxes to provide those details before uh, i actually check out right so these interfaces are called as user interface right so it is there in some device or in some vehicle or in some uh, uh, web pages right so they they are like uh, they are their device interfaces um, and and whatever that we are seeing in the web pages are like called as user interfaces now from api context right uh, there is a application programming interface context we are referring to an interface that is between two different programs or two different applications so let's say that application a wanted to access or make use of certain functionality which is available in application b right so application a will request that via an api and the api will take care of accessing that information or accessing that functionality and providing that in the form of response to application a so that is that is what we are calling it as like api application programming interface so uh, i think like uh, it's it's better to see or uh, like better to understand the meaning of api via uh, a non it example right so uh, let's take a non it example like i i go to a restaurant and uh, i i got a table i have access to a menu card where i can see all available items like uh, the items available in the hotel right so i i can select the items needed and then like i uh, uh, i i can like select whatever items that i wanted to uh, go for but still i cannot directly get into the kitchen to go and pick those items right so i need to wait for the waiter once the waiter comes i have an option to provide my specifications so even though like these are the items that are available in the hotel i can provide some specifications from my side saying that okay so i need uh, this much spice level this much salt level or like it needs to be completely cooked or half cooked so those kind of specification i can provide but still i cannot go and order a non veg food in a vegetarian restaurant right so there are some limitations restrictions all those things are there so once i finalize the order so i will place that order but i am placing it to the waiter and the waiter is taking my order to the chef who is in the kitchen and he will get the food back to me when it is ready right so i am not directly interacting with uh, kitchen or the chef who is in the kitchen but i am interacting through a waiter so if you see the waiter is an api 
and uh, application or uh, uh, client is the customer who is on the uh, restaurant. And then the server or assets is in the uh, kitchen, right? So that's, that's, that's how we need to take it up. And let's take another uh, real-time example, so like, which is related to IT, right? So I need to uh, book a ticket for uh, like traveling in a flight from Delhi to Bangalore. So what I will do, like, I'll just go, if, if I'm very specific about a particular airline, and this is the airline where I wanted to book a ticket, I can directly get into uh, that specific airline, which is like in our case, Indigo, and then like I go, uh, select uh, the from and to and then like what date I am traveling and then like I will go and book the ticket, right? So in this case, what happens is like all the flight related information is going to be available in Indigo database and it is going to be available for once, once I click on search, an uh, API is going to pick the data and then like going to provide back to my web application as the results, which is going to give me uh, uh, all options. Like, okay, so on that particular day, might be multiple flights. So I'm going to get the details of all the things where I can pick up a particular flight and go. So this is an internal API. So what I mean by internal API is the website or the application is provided by Indico and the backend, the database is going to be again Indigo, right? In that case, the API is just interacting with the internal application to provide that information. Let's take another example where this booking application itself is someone like other than an airline. It's not an airline. So like they have someone is like creating a mobile app where they have to get the information from multiple airlines. It's not just one specific airline. And these airlines are no way related to the uh, uh, booking uh, website, right? So in that case, how are they going to communicate and fetch the data, right? So every individual airline will have their own data, but they are exposing the data in the form of API. So, all their flight information, timing, rating, and all other informations will be exposed in the form of API. And these Yatra, who is creating a mobile app for booking flight, they are kind of subscriber for those API. Obviously, Indigo, SpiceJet, and Vistra will be charging. And same way, once the ticket is booked for a particular airline, Yastra is going to give some commission. So all those things are there. That's a commercial part. But the communication is happening via uh, uh, API. So every individual airline is like exposing and their data in the form of API. And Yastra is making use of that API. And then once, a uh, customer is like looking for a particular booking. Once it collects the data from all three uh, different APIs from different airlines and they merge it and they give a consolidated uh, result in the result. So now as a customer, I have the option to go, go and choose whatever flight that I wanted to go with. Like but that could be based on the fare, that could be based on the uh, timings or whatever it is, right? So any any travel uh, booking thing or hotel booking uh, uh, websites are like all using uh, the APIs which are exposed by uh, specific uh, uh, airlines or travel agencies or whatever it is. So with this, what we will get into like, what is the need for an API now, right? So uh, API, yes, it's there. Uh, so from the day like uh, uh, computers has got uh, invented, but uh, what is what is uh, the hype that is, uh, it's very much needed now, right? Why, what is the hype that is having now? Right? So uh, in 90s, uh, 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 in 1990s, like we had, when internet was like 
invented, right? So uh, that's when like all websites got into picture. So each and every organization started having their own websites, but those websites are like very static websites. They don't have uh, kind of any interactions as we have now. But eventually it got evolved and now in the current state, like we are supposed to interact with a lot of other channels, right? So we have like vehicles, which are like internet enabled. And then like we have a lot of sensor related things like which, which gathers weather or any other, any other details. And then like uh, game consoles, which are uh, internet enabled and then smartphones, tablets, internet TVs, connected appliances, partners. So if everyone is like uh, from all, all uh, uh, um, organizations or all devices or all uh, internet enabled things are like around around as like on, on our day to day activities right and all these communications are happening via uh, api so api is the only mode to connect with all these uh, devices and and get the information so uh, that is that is the main need for for uh, api now like the way api has uh, emerged it is it's it's only because of the need like earlier it was just the static pages which are coming from the back end now uh, it is it's a lot of channels that we need to interact and pull the data and we need api to interact with that so with that like let's let's very uh, let's look into very high level technical details of what what an api is about so as we see in the first slide like it is it is a communication channel for two different software applications right so when we say that and application a is interfacing or like looking to pull some data from uh, the application b so it is passing some informations like input values and then operations. Say, for example, like I'm just getting some, it's, it's like an SQL query, right? So I wanted to uh, uh, get some information from this particular application. I'm passing input values like, okay, these are the operations that I need to execute on this particular data. And then these are the values that I am passing. And same way with that, the API will take care of uh, uh, um, sending that information to the backend system. Backend system will uh, do the necessary actions and then it responds back. A simple example. Hello. Okay. So uh, when it comes to when it so, so for simple example that I can take is like okay it's the same uh, uh, um, the airline example that we have seen right so I am just booking the ticket I am saying that okay from is from Delhi like okay to is uh, Bangalore and uh, this is the date that I wanted to travel right so those are called uh, uh, input values and operations is like uh, book for a ticket or like search for a, a, a different airlines. So that that is like operation. So based on which it will pull the required information from the back end, and then it sends back like, okay, yes, I have the information. That is what the status code is. And then output is like all the informations that are required, right? So it will obviously the output will have the details about the flight and uh, the possible options and the fare and all of that information. So this is this is this is happening via API, and when any backend system exposes a API, right, it obviously will have certain contracts. Say for example, I am Indigo, and I am exposing my flight information, fare information, uh, via API, and when I am exposing it, I will like, uh, and and if someone is using that to build their own app, there will be some contract agreement which will be defined between these two parties right the person who is building the app and the person who is providing the uh, airline information or uh, uh, flight information so the way it works is 
it is not a it's not a paper agreement or like document agreement it is about the agreement within the api interface itself like okay so we will say that i am expecting only these kind of information from you on top of it like i will send back this this kind of information back to you and we can also set some policies like what i mean by policies is like certain service level agreements some transaction limit say for example service like agreement when i am exposing a api i am supposed to have the uptime of 99.5 of 9 percentage right so like my api should be available all time so that this particular person who is using this particular organization who has used my api to build their application can provide uh, uh, service to their uh, customers right so so i am expecting as a, as a, as a uh, uh, mobile app organization i am always like expecting this api to be up and running throughout so the service sla should be like 99.9 percentage throughout and transaction limit say i am just exposing this api and the api is going to be used not just by one particular organization it can be by many organizations right so for many organization if they start hitting my api uh, with a lot of volume there is going to be a problem for my api so i am just setting certain transaction limit right all those things are considered as policies which can be defined when an api uh, api is uh, exposed and same way security like i i am just exposing an api my api cannot be uh, invoked by everyone right so like i I'm, because like i am making it for commercial purpose and i don't want everyone to invoke my api or like everyone if they start invoking like they may uh, they may like uh, do some impact to my backend system so i don't want all of them to uh, access so in that case i wanted to restrict it with some security mechanism so all these things are called as like contracts policies securities can be uh, set for certain apis and all those things will be upfront laid out even before a particular uh, company or particular organization subscribes to that particular api okay so then like we'll talk about like types of api so when i when i say like type of api there are like uh, 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 different uh, uh, the categorization is by consumption or like categorization is by intention so what i mean by that is like okay so as an organization i am exposing an api right and that a- api is consumed only within my organization like okay so for example uh, there is an application for order management and there is an application for order fulfillment and there could be like many other departments within an organization right if an api is used by an application of another department and it is not exposed to external world then then it's called like internal api and then like external api is nothing but api exposed to external consumer as we have seen in the previous examples right like the flight booking and all other things are external api so like i am exposing it to uh, an external customer right and then two partners say for example like i i i have a partner like uh, as, as part of my business like i have a partner and and this particular api is only for the communication between uh, myself and the partner uh, application so in that case uh, it's it's called as like partner uh, type of api okay so what 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 is the difference like internal external partner the way i write my api the way i define the sla i way i uh, define the policies for the api differs based on uh, this categorization if it is a internal i no need to even like care about the security right i can expose this thing because like this particular api is going to be consumed within my organization uh, the applications within my organization so i no need to worry about like setting up a lot of uh, uh, security uh, uh, implementations on that i no need to even care about it but the same way if i am like exposing my api to external world right i need to like really take care of security because uh, uh, let's take uh, google um, um, 
API. So Google provides uh, uh, location related uh, information, right? So, and uh, uh, any um, Uber or Ola, they are using uh, Google API to get the location information of a device for, for a particular vehicle and the location information of the caller who has like uh, asking for a vehicle, right? So all, all so, uh, so Uber, Uber like subscribe to have like uh, um, um, Google API. So as an individual, I cannot just go and access uh, Google uh, API and get, get make use of it because like Uber has subscribed and they are paying for each of the transaction. And that's the reason that uh, uh, Google is allowing even for Uber to consume that API, right? So Google needs to have a security mechanism in place even to restrict uh, others to invoke their API no, 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 if it is not necessary, right? And then the other way of categorization is by intention, right? So uh, what is the intention? Like, okay, intention is uh, what, what exactly I'm exposing it, okay? So I'm exposing this particular uh, API only for this particular system. And there is something called like process API. Process API is nothing but an orchestration. Say for example, like uh, if I wanted to, uh, I, I have like multiple applications like order management and, and order fulfillment and shipment. So each and every uh, uh, application exposes something called like system, system API. And if I want to do an orchestration within uh, these systems, that's when like I will have process API. And experience API is nothing but it's, it's a channel. Say for example, I have a, a mobile app, I have tablet, I have home uh, appliances, right? And all these applications can invoke an API, but I cannot have a same API for, for all these channels. I need to have like different APIs, right? And that is what we are calling it as like experience API. So this is, so this is a different types of API and, uh, and the categorization is by consumption and the categorization is by uh, uh, intention, right? Now let's see like the growth of, uh, growth of API, like how, uh, uh, API has grown uh, over the period of time. The first API got uh, uh, published in the year 2000 by Salesforce. And during the same period, like end of the year, eBay has uh, created their uh, um, API. And then uh, slowly in 2003, four, like Flickr has uh, uh, exposed their API. And 2006, like the major uh, development happened, like because like a lot of companies, like uh, top companies like Facebook, uh, Twitter, Google, Amazon, they they exposed, uh, they started exposing their APIs. And 2010, like uh, we have uh, Instagram, right? And we know like okay, so uh, uh, being in Instagram, I should be able to post my photo in in. Uh, Facebook, right? So how is that happening? That is through the API that is being exposed by both these uh, applications. So it started in 2000 and we, when we say like growth of API, we are only talking about uh, uh, the web APIs are uh, the, uh, yeah, web APIs are like APIs that, that we are like using it in mobile. And uh, uh, started in 2000 and we, currently have about like 23,000 APIs, which are used uh, across uh, um, uh, globe. And uh, uh, that is available in a largest API repository, which is like programmable web. So basically what happens is like, when I, if I create uh, uh, any API for any commercial purpose, or even for uh, uh, free usage, uh, how should I expose that to, uh, the world, right? So I need to first uh, uh, register or like subscribe to any any repository so that like any, anyone can like get into that repository and then like search for my API and then like they can start using it because that's where they will find uh, the details about the API, how to invoke it. And then obviously they can uh, look for the subscription process and then uh, use it. So with that, 
like uh, we're coming to uh, uh, how how the api future is going to be so in future like api is going to be seen as a product right because like api has a lot of commercial values in it like uh, uh, most of the apis that are created now it has like direct monetization right so like uh, uh, google exposing the map you may map api it's it's uh, it's being monetized uh, because like a lot of uh, 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 taxi uh, companies are started using it and it is not taxi like okay we, we a lot of mobile apps are using it and uh, it's it's being used uh, by a uh, lot of lot of uh, applications right and how how google is getting benefited google like uh, is going it says already charging for each and every transaction that uh, the all other applications are making so that is that is the revenue for uh, google so, so similar way like uh, there are so there are many uh, uh, apis and obviously like uh, the a company which is exposing the api need to uh, have uh, the required data uh, for example like if you take uh, weather channel so if you take go to uh, mobile app and uh, we have an app for mobile checking the weather right so uh, how how like the the company who has created the weather application is definitely not having the data they are like getting the data from some external organization who are uh, like collecting that uh, weather application data right keeping sensors all over and collecting the data and they are providing it to this particular uh, mobile app developer or de developing company and uh, uh, the moment i start using that web weather weather details i need to like pay pay for uh, that that organization who is exposing that data so similar way if, if i am like going to come up with some api which is going to be benefited by any any organization or it's going to be benefited by any developer and then obviously uh, it's it's going to be uh, 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 so commercially uh, benefited to me right so that is that is uh, that is why like they are seeing api as a product and then hybrid integration platform so what i mean by hybrid integration platform is like uh, we know that uh, after uh, cloud has come into picture uh, many organizations are keeping their applications uh, both in land and in, in their in their own data center which is on premises or in the cloud environment right so how how these communications happens how those integration happens because i have some of my key applications in my uh, own building and, and some applications in azure or amazon cloud right so uh, uh, how but but both these applications need to communicate in order to have my uh, business uh, uh, processes uh, um, work properly right so in that case uh, 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 how is that communication happening that is why that's going to be uh, an api and already it's it's happening via api so and then like multi channel uh, integration earlier we were like only having web channel like uh, web applications as a channel for for any kind of uh, uh, communications interactions but now like we have mobile tablet ivr machines home appliances and internet of things coming into picture so like all these kind of integrations definitely needs to happen via api uh, so and then uh, uh, obviously we have a real time um, uh, synchronization of uh, iot we know like most of our home appliances are like now internet enabled and and the communications within those are again like going to happen via uh, uh, api so uh, net net yes there's a lot of future for api and uh, uh, api development has grown as we have seen it uh, started in a small number and we have out of like 23000 apis available currently uh, for for a public usage whether whether it is for commercial purpose or it's for uh, free uh, uh, whether it is available free uh, uh, the, the count is increasing day by day and the kind of channels that are coming in like the api is growing a lot so like yeah i think uh, as as 
you guys are like into technology like well studies right so uh, uh, understand more about the api and start being a developer for uh, uh, get into api development uh, and are like try and use existing api and 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 try to develop um, a useful uh, application which can be invoked by many consumers so with that i wanted to conclude and uh, definitely will take uh, questions uh, if, if there is any I think uh, we'll take some questions at the end of the session. Uh, yeah, Mrs. Arshana, I think you can go to the next speaker. Thank you, sir, for sharing uh, your knowledge with us on the APIs in the real world. Well, the women are not behind. This is the time for our next speaker of the evening, Dr. Pooja Vashisht, Assistant Professor, in computer science department, SPM College, University of... In computer science department, she's also a working and a visiting faculty at Wilfrid Laurel University, Canada. She's having 18 years of enriched experience as an academician. She's also contributing as a subject matter expert in machine learning at Wilfrid Laurel University and teaching various courses like compilers, databases, software engineering, computer hardware, and machine learning, computer hardware, and machine learning at universities, universities of repute, like UAFT, McMaster, and York University in Ontario. Welcome, ma'am. Over, Over to you. Thank you. Give me a moment, please. Presentation mode, please. Yep, okay. thank you. First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers, organizers and convener of the webinar to give me this opportunity of presenting advancements regarding the software engineering paradigm. So Currently, I am working as visiting faculty with Wilfrid Laurier University, and I got this opportunity to look uh, deeper into the software engineering principles. So the presentation is, as you can see, is titled as Object-Oriented Software Engineering, uh, where we are going to focus on the emerging technologies for the same. And uh, why object-oriented engineering? The reason being, if we look at what direction is software engineering moving today? What are the technologies of the future? And exactly how will we develop and maintain software in the year, say, current year 2020 or 30 years from now, from 2050? Uh, yes, of course, uh, if I talk about future, so future is not so easy to predict. However, it's quite evident, like we'll see from the further information that I'll be sharing with you is that the basis of all the future technologies lies in object-oriented software engineering. 
the reason that today we want fast deployment and we want that delivery should be continuous and we really want to reuse the components don't want to reinvent the wheel again and again so and if you look towards the object oriented paradigm all these things are all these concepts are basically uh, part of proper implementation of oops that's why the reason that the further technologies that we i'm going to uh, touch upon briefly because we have 30 minutes presentation only uh, you'll see that they act actually belonging to this particular concept so uh, let's um, without um, no more further delay let's start with few of uh, the very latest and upcoming technologies uh, in the industry of software engineering so starting from aspect oriented technology first of all so what are the backbones of this particular technology so starting from concern so as we know concern of a software product is a specific set of behaviors of that particular product for example if you look at a banking product one concern would be set of interest computations so bank pay interest to depositors and charge interest to borrowers so that would be one concern the major functionality and the second concern would be writing of this information to the audit trail so if i talk about the core concern what is the core concern of a software product core concern of the software product would be the primary set of behaviors of that particular product so if we take the banking example what is the core construct core concern of course both um, calculating the set of interest and of course writing to information uh, writing information to the audit trail both of them are the concerns however the core concern is interest computation which is clearly primarily whereas writing to the audit trail seems absolutely essential however it's not a core banking concern so that is what aspect oriented technology looks at so the very first thing it takes care of is separation of concerns that is ensuring uh, that modularity is there and which is a highly desirable and underlying principle for this technique of aspect uh, oriented engineering to achieve modularization by designing a software with each concern isolated in its own module or groups of modules so thereby this looks at maximizing the cohesion and minimizing coupling so the very first concern over here uh, however there are few other things like that has to be taken care at this particular position say for example some are your cost cutting concerns now what are these cost cutting concerns cost cutting concerns are those that cut across the module boundaries right because we always have the modules which are interacting so there would be concerns that would be cutting across these module boundaries and for example such as the audit trail concern in the banking product so because audit trail concern in the banking product is interacting with the interest computation as well now these cross cutting concerns can actually have deleterious effect on the maintenance because of the presence of these concern it can lead to regression faults that is when we go out to update a particular module during maintenance it can lead to faults into several other untouched modules so if a concern has to be implemented in a variety of otherwise unrelated modules a change to that concern had to be made consistently to all the instances of the concern in the relative module as well so that is that makes maintenance difficult so here what we look over here is uh, the graphical view of, of aspect oriented technology where we are trying to separate all the cross cutting cutting concerns because it clearly violates modularization and basically the aspect of concerns that is what the aim of aspect oriented programming is to isolate such cross cutting concerns by letting the developer sequester cross cutting concerns in special modules called as aspects so whatever the cross cutting modules are what we do is we develop them in special modules which are called as aspects and 
aspects are going to consist of advice. Now, what is advice? Over here, what we can see is, we can see um, in the diagram, three different kinds of um, audit trails, which are behaving as cross-cutting concerns. And therefore, what we do is, we try to combine them into special modules called as aspects. Like we see here in the example that in the bank routing, in the banking product, we'll have an advice that would include an audit trail routine. So these aspects are going to contain the advice and that would be a code that is linked to specific places in the software. So therefore we are not going to have the complete module uh, say of the audit trail over there, but we are going to have a link that's going to in the form of advice that's going to be linked to specific places in the software. And an example of advice is an audit trail routine in the bank software, as I just mentioned, a point cut is would be a place in the code where the cost cutting concern is to be applied. That is where the advice is to be executed. So what we see is that finally the aspect would be consisting of two pieces. That would be the advice and its associated set of point cuts. So here, what we can see is this, how the separation of concern have been achieved by placing each cross-cutting concern into its own aspect. So every cross-cutting concern is placed into its own aspect where we are isolating the relevant code in the advice and therefore reducing the risk of the regression fault. So we have this particular uh, one format of the code here logged in the advice only, which can be referred to various places using the point cut, which is nothing but just a link. So we see over here, the six audit trails were finally replaced by six point cuts. Of course, uh, to uh, implement the aspect oriented technology, we do need an aspect oriented platform as well. So we'll need an aspect oriented programming language and a compiler, which, which should be supportive of the same. So a compiler for an aspect oriented programming language is called a Weaver. So Weaver are the special kinds of compilers. And what would be the major task of a Weaver? The major task of Weaver is to insert the relevant advice at each point cut before compiling the code. And this operation is termed as composition. Of course, we cannot think it to be something manual. So we need to have a compiler, say, Weaver, that would help in this composition. So uh, it means that the development and maintenance are performed on the uncompiled source code, including its aspects and point cuts. So that is how separation of concern is thereby achieved. And it now becomes just localized to the aspect and is not thrown everywhere over the particular product. And um, it's good to know that are many of the favorite programming platforms are already supporting the aspect oriented um, technology. And we do have the extensions for the same in the programming languages uh, like aspect J, which is meant for Java and is currently one of the most popular uh, platforms to work in. So, uh, that is uh, what I just mentioned. Uh, so finally, uh, if we look at aspect-oriented programming, it's just one part of aspect-oriented development. So development would be done in several phases, starting from requirement up till testing and then further maintenance. So development is just one part of it. And um, in, other, in other words, we also call it as early aspects. So finally, the primary aim of uh, an aspect oriented development would be the early identification of both functional and non informational cross cutting concerns, which is actually a very major task for a software development organization to identify those concerns which are interacting with other modules as well. And aspect allows us to identify these functional and non functional 
cut cross cutting concerns at a very early stage and this helps in a proper modular development of the complete product and uh, it would not be surprising to say that um, this particular technology is has been adopted by so many upcoming products and also famous organizations like we have ibm has its own ibm web sphere a framework which allows aspect oriented technology and of course uh, apart from uh, aspect j we also have jboss which supports aspect in java so that is uh, one particular um, famous upcoming uh, technologies for software engineering so apart from this let's look at another technology which is known as model driven technology so one problem which every software developer would face is moving a product into a new platform it is like we have developed the product for one particular platform let's say android and now i want to move it to so many other different platforms so that's a major concern however it can be well addressed if we for have the model driven architecture that would solve the problem itself at the analysis level rather than the design level so as i mentioned software development is a process which starts from requirements then analysis design and implementation so design level is very close to implementation level making changes at design are catastrophic so if we have model driven architecture will be able to make the changes well at the analysis level so here we see it in a, a diagrammatic format uh, where what we see is the functionality of the desired software product is specified by a means of a platform independent model or pim and platform independent model can be represented by a graphical language like uml unified modeling language or any other appropriate domain specific language that is meant specially for the problem domain so now this can be mapped on to a platform specific model which can be any one chosen from corba.net g2ee so it can be any platform specific model and again this can be expressed in uml so this can be then further used to generate the code for the implementation so when i say generating code for the implementation that is psm is translated into the code this is done using an automatic code generator and run on a computer so that's the best uh, feature of model driven technology that we will be able to specify the diagrams at a higher level of abstraction using uml for pi pim and psm however when it comes to generation of code it's done automatically with the help of a code generator so we can have code being generated for several different platforms and this can be repeated for multiple platforms accordingly by choosing the correct automatic code generator so this this particular model basically mda or model driven technology is so much useful and is of course a very powerful mechanism for achieving the portability that's the best part of it and this is what is desired uh, in times of today we have so many um billions and billions of uh, mobile devices handheld devices various kinds of electronic instruments using different platforms so achieving platform independent model is something which is very much highly desirable and yes of course we want that these things should be automated to a level as much as possible the third kind of technology which is very famous is component based technology and will also uh, look at the short comparison of component based technology with the service oriented technology so what's the goal of uh, this technology it is to again construct a standard collection of reusable components so reusability is talk of the uh, present and in fact even future why because this would avoid and save us uh, with the precious time of reinventing the wheel each time in all the future software that will be constructed by only choosing a standard architecture and standard reusable frameworks and also 
inserting standard reusable code artifacts into the hotspots of the framework. So component-based technology actually enables that. So that is the software products will be built by composing reusable components only. And this is, of course, can be done using an automated tool. In fact, recently I was uh, going through a research paper which, is, which was specifically based on uh, component selection for component-based technology. So people are applying like all sort of artificial intelligence and machine learning to make the component selection process simpler. Because all we are aiming at is product automation at the max level. So product automation, as I mentioned, is a very much key aspect of component-based software engineering so that we can have things done by choosing a standard architecture, reusable frameworks, and reusable code artifacts, which is we are actually aiming at the product automation. Uh, so yes, of course, to uh, make this work, uh, that is what I mentioned in the beginning that we'll see that all the technologies are uh, nothing but different modifications or extensions of the basic OOPS concept. The very favorite thing that we start learning when we were introduced to C++ uh, after studying C for the very first time, and it was also wonderful. Uh, so yes, of course, for this technology to work, the components are required to be independent and fully encapsulated. Information hiding would be very important. And the components have to be at a very higher level of abstraction than the objects. Why? Because states cannot be shared. It's something which is done at the runtime. Uh, uh, so states cannot be shared because uh, everything is worked upon the uncompiled code. So finally, uh, achieving component-based software engineering would, uh, of course, lead to order of magnitude increases in the productivity because uh, we see that product automation is one of the major goals. And it would also lead to better software quality. And yes, will decrease in time to market and maintain efforts. And later, after a couple of slides, we're going to see it will directly relate to one of the very hot trends in the software engineering technology, which is continuous uh, delivery and deployment. So component based technology really supports that. Uh, yes, of course, but the current state, as I said, is far from the ambitious target. That is why we see so much of research happening in this particular area in its different aspects. The second, uh, uh, the fourth one, sorry, uh, is service-oriented technology. And uh, many times, uh, component-based technology is uh, pitted against service-oriented technology, and we'll also try to understand the difference between them. So what is service-oriented uh, technology? And each one of us are using it, actually. So this is a kind of software service which is being provided by the software service providers over a particular network and these days it's internet to meet some specific needs of the service con consumers so to understand the comparison if you just compare uh, using microsoft word document on your um, pc versus google docs so when you are using microsoft word you are using a particular product it's installed on your system however the same things you can achieve by doing on a web browser by creating a document using google docs so if you're using google docs that example of the service industry so uh, that is how uh, service industry is getting so popular these days because uh, users now don't need to install the particular product onto their systems and uh, they can just use it on the go so that is what is service oriented computing is, which works to meet specific needs of the service consumers. Let's look at the brief comparison of these two technologies, service oriented versus component based technology. So first of all, if we look at them, both of them are instances of distributed 
computing, be it services or uh, component based, because services are also distributed over a network and with components. When you talk about components, components that we are trying to use and select to build a new product are also generally distributed over a network. And both of them are based on the reuse technologies. Both of them are aiming at reuse technologies. Apart from this, it straight away leads us uh, to the fact that encapsulation becomes essential for both these technologies to ensure that components and the services are indeed independent and only then they can be made reusable. And how are we going to ensure that this can be ensured if the modules are designed in a way that it aims at highest possible cohesion and lowest possible coupling so that we can ensure reusability and separation of concerns. And then common thing about one common thing about both these technologies is that they are they have low entry cost because we have already components and the services which are existing and we need to combine them in the proper way so they, they, they can be used. So a lot of work again going upon the interfacing of various components as well. So how we can work on the interfaces so that the existing components can be used. And then another uh, comparison, if we look at them, is that there is no need to install the software, configure it, and then continually update it with each new release. Instead, what we can do is we can have the latest version of the software, which is automatically downloaded each time. And that would be really good to do. So just like um, Zoom made us install all the new updates, stating that we won't be able to have all its functionalities if it's, it was not done before a particular date. Then finally, both these technologies are also geographically location independent because both components and services are usually accessible over the web and web we know is present everywhere and can be used with any appropriate device. So does that mean uh, that, um, I, so I was, I started the topic with comparison, but we have looked at the similarities. So does that mean all the, both these technologies are like similar? Are they mirror images? No, they are not. Why? Because the major difference between these two technology is the level of granularity. That is the level of detail data that they look at. So when you talk about component based technology, this constructs a software product by combining the components into an executable program. Whereas in case of service oriented technology that utilizes existing executable programs. So that's the basic difference with components. We are combining the compiled components on, only into executable program, whereas service oriented technology is utilizing the already existing executable programs. So it's uh, working with your executable files. So therefore, bas basic building blocks of component based technology would be components. Whereas with service oriented technology, the basic building pro blocks would be complete executable programs. So that's one major difference. And the second difference is that although we have component based technology and service oriented technologies as emerging technologies of these days, already the early versions of service oriented technologies are being used today worldwide by service consumers. Whereas component based technology still requires breakthrough research before it can be utilized properly in practice and a lot of things happening around it. Uh, then we now uh, look further briefly at some of the other technologies uh, which would um, which are kind of usage enabled because of the emerging technologies as we all know the term social computing. Uh, so social computing is used in context of the ways in which computers support our social behavior and we find it spread out everywhere in today's time be it Facebook, Instagram or our behavior when we are making purchases. So that is why the social interactions and the structure 
brought about and supported by these technologies have become thing of instru- uh, high interest because they really support the way marketing can be designed and these are only some of the examples uh, which help us in figuring out uh, social behaviors of the humans uh, yes of course there's a lot um, behind it and we won't say it's an emerging technology however it is a usage which is related to an emerging technology and what are the kind of computations that help us in making the social behavior work like say um promoter for especially for the marketing business in the form of online auctions multiplayer online games and collaborative filtering so uh, i think many of you will be familiar with the term collaborative filtering where like you go on amazon and purchase a particular thing and you get recommendation for so many other products or even on linkedin if you happen to look at a particular profile so linkedin keeps on referring that people who looked at this particular profile also looked at these other profiles so you get um encouraged to dig in further and then soon you get a promotional offer uh, of considering the linkedin uh premium version right so that is how it's been used so then looking at all these things and uh, i've been uh, talking about this uh, like repeatedly web engineering is no more behind because everything is happening on the web and just like the software production in say classical paradigm or in general industry as well we want a software which has to be fault free delivered on time within budget satisfying the users need right but how are these things different when it comes to web engineering these things are very different when it comes to web engineering also far more difficult to achieve because web is so volatile uh, it is so unstable it keeps on changing all the time we have unstable requirements we have wide range of user skills then uh, we hardly have any opportunity to train the users because the web technology is something which is changing in the most uh, i would say the speedy way it has so much of variety of content and yes very short maintenance on around time so if you go a website draining down not working properly the maintenance team hardly have any time to work on it to make it up again because having it down for longer time means loss of business then apart from that you, human interface is of prime importance we want it to be all graphical then uh, web software should work on diverse range or run on diverse kind of runtime environments we don't want it to be running on one type of pc and not on other type of pc because it's running over internet which connects the computers worldwide then the very much important issues are privacy and the security issues which are of course not taken seriously at least at the end of user whenever we are asked certain questions before um, downloading a particular app we keep on just uh, clicking yes 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 to all these things without bothering about the computer security issues it can bring about so that is uh, one particular thing and uh, that's why when we talk about the web software computer security issue should be something which should be imbibed into it already which should be actually imbibed we'll look at it in the computer security title uh so the next one being cloud technology a cloud technology or cloud computing is a very diverse domain in its own kind and lots of research is going on in it and from where did we get this term the cloud it is nothing but an extension of the term i cloud i cloud means information cloud which means the communication range of a mobile device to the internet and yes as we know that so many things are on the cloud these days and one of the very um, popular thing that we use is software as an infrastructure that is saas available on cloud so again related to is is the web of today so we started somewhere with web 2.0 and now we have web 3.0 um zero today which is known as semantic web 
and uh, semantic web we see around us all the time when you we type a particular uh, search string on google uh, you're just halfway through and you see so many other suggestions coming up or you start working on an email and you already have so many suggestions being supported by the google software for you to help write the email so that is what is uh, this is like i mean just one example uh, and there's much more to the semantic web whole lot of technologies as you can see it's amalgamation of so many various technologies being put together in the collection of in the collection of a hypertext documents being clubbed together but uh, yes of course at one end this is the future way that how the web is being used and it brings up a very important issue that is that of computer security and as i mentioned computer security is not something that the users will opt for so if it it's uh, left to the users it's humanly like um, they are not going to care about the computer security until it becomes a problem and this is uh, very famously referred to as dancing pigs problem so it's something that has to be embedded into the software itself like if uh, we uh, when we uh, for example in all our emails we know that it has an automatic um, way of filtering out the spam emails right we are not doing it we don't care to do it but uh, our email software filters out all the spam emails for us that is one way of imbibing computer security without our taking care of it so computer security is a very challenging issue in front of any software organization so in this chapter um, i actually quickly outlined the 10 emerging technologies uh, in the software engineering paradigm and just to connect uh, all this discussion with what's going on in the industry these days as of course uh, this particular thing stands always true that it's tough making predictions but still we always want to prepare ourselves for the future so if we look at these other emerging technologies these are all related to the kind of software engineering paradigm that i have been talking about so referring to be it virtual reality voice assistant ai or machine learning or motion ui so all these technologies are based on the way we are developing our softwares and it's so enormous so vast so that's why we want that reusability should be our prime focus uh, uh, so these days uh, the most upcoming things that we find is uh, in case of apps um, that we can see over here is one is progressive web apps so these are the apps which don't require us to download right and fill up our device space so we just have a url and we can run the application from there so it um, has a bit of it to do in the cloud technology as well the way it is being done and it is also example of a service oriented technology pwa apart from that uh, these days uh, we have web views uh, so web, what's a web view web view is an in app browser and just the way instagram works so uh, basically in instagram when you want to open a particular uh, detail so you don't need to go to google to open it up it will open within the application that is what an in app browser is so that is again an example of reusability and links us to component based technology so clearly these emerging technologies link us to the seven most emerging trends of the software development these days so software development is just part of the complete software process so uh, these are the most emerging trends of software development process and then finally something which is of interest to the software programmers so uh, what should be this always remain a very hot question what should be the programming languages that i should be working upon because usually it happens we come out trained in one particular language and we see that it's nowhere so i worked very hard training myself into r a couple of years back and these days it's all python now so this is the list of the languages uh, 
in the most desirable order so python being the hottest one in the market is again something which is component based and highly modularized then the next one upcoming is kotlin so kotlin is again a general purpose language which is built to work um, uh, inter, uh, which is built to work really well and uh, is interoperable with java uh, and it's good to uh, see that java is still up on the list uh, uh, it's been 25 years that we have been using java and it's still in high demand of course object oriented and uh, then we have javascript node.js all are various extensions of java which allow us to create good uh, web products so like i was just referring the pwa and uh, the in-app browsers and then we have typescript typescript is superscript of javascript and these days we have a new language say go which is uh, you know with high speed it's uh, moving uh, topping up in the charts so go is an uh, object oriented language again inspired uh, both from java and c++ and then finally we have this swift uh, also one of uh, the upcoming languages and the good thing about swift is uh, swift combines goodness of both uh, objective c and um, even object oriented uh, platforms so if you are fan of uh, c language you should also consider um, learning swift so these are the list of references and thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity i love being part of the webinar So I would stop sharing now. I think, yeah, uh, I've already sh uh, stopped it. So over to the convener. Well, thank you, ma'am, for such a knowledgeable. Yeah, thank you, ma'am, for such a knowledgeable presentation. Uh, there are certain questions that the participants have asked. So can I go on? Yeah, sure. OK, so first participant has asked, which technique is more effective and user friendly out of those you have shared okay so you are referring to this list i believe this one right so you're referring to this list service oriented technology is something that uh, it's really hot and upcoming uh -huh. um, because um, you know it saves both our uh, both time and space for us and also provide us uh, for provide us with what we need service oriented technology okay so you are suggesting service oriented technology yes okay thank you ma'am our next question from the participant is that uh, is it that it only depends on context and characteristic of Hello. application being built or does it depend on any other feature uh, i'm sorry your voice was cut Okay, I'll repeat the question for you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Is it that it only depends on the context and characteristics of applications being built or uh, does it depend on any other uh, perspective? So the very first uh, point is, it depends a lot on the context and the characteristics uh, of the application that is being developed because that's the very first thing. And it's actually part of the requirement and requirements. I would say, what is the context and what is the, uh, um, characteristic. And only after that we get it because it's the most important thing. We further decide that how to implement it. What would be the platform? These things come on later. Okay. So ma'am, our next question from the participant is about the motion UIs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you would like to know more about uh, motion UIs. Yeah, so sure. They are telling ki, yeah, they are telling, can you explain it a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So uh, motion UI, uh, it's one of the latest uh, technologies uh, coming up today. And uh, actually this is, uh, spread like, you know, uh, like a wildfire in the web design. Why? Because of its simplistic uh, deployment and flexible customization. So motion UI is directly linked to drawing uh, um, 
in motion user interfaces and this has been very helpful in drawing an end user attention to the content on your website so uh, it's like uh, you know um, you see the movable components on the website right if you are looking at a particular web page and uh, just compare a web page which is static no content moving and a web page where the content is moving so uh, it's human that we get attracted to a content which is moving so that is what is motion ui about i hope that answers the question okay ma'am the next resident to what ex yeah to what extent sap is in accordance with component based modeling sap is uh, perfectly in accordance with a uh, component based modeling so if you are learning uh, sap it would be like uh, uh, a good start for you so it's it's based on component based technology okay thank you ma'am thank you for yeah, you're, you're your knowledgeable presentation thank you ma'am uh, now i request dr klinziger jeperson to give away the vote of thanks thank you it gives me immense pleasure to extend a vote of thanks to all who have been a part of day 1 of the international webinar emerging trends of computer science and it on behalf of department of computer science and it i express sincere gratitude to engineer a victor sundararaj for contributing to this webinar as a resource person he presented the nuances of the approach live enterprises which is the ability of an enterprise to sense and process information from both past and in real time and intelligently and efficiently he made us realize that it is mandatory for the educators and budding engineers to be aware of this change and be equipped on the required foundational technologies of future thank you sir for that wonderful presentation next i would like to extend hearty thanks to engineer sakthendran arunachalam for gladly accepting our invitation and joining us from us at a very odd time his high level talk about api with few real world examples was really impressive and enlightening thank you sir i would like to extend my profound gratitude to dr pooja rashis for her time despite her busy schedule she beautifully discussed the emerging technologies of object oriented software engineering such as aspect oriented technology model driven technology service oriented technology and so on and threw light on the present and future aspects in the respective area thank you ma'am so this is all for today's session so we'll meet tomorrow on the same platform at 3 pm ist until then stay safe stay healthy good night so we are ending the session here